Okay, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Robert. I'll be your host. This is the 50 New York paintings, and there are 50 Monet paintings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art, and a few other places. And this is a live stream program to go through all 50 of those paintings. So let's go ahead and get started. We always welcome people to introduce themselves. If you want to tell us your first name, where you're connecting from, and your favorite artist or type of art, feel free to do so. You can type that in the Q&A section. Usually the Q&A section is down at the bottom of your screen. And unfortunately, we don't have time to do a Zoom demonstration, how to use all the different features. But suffice to say, the two things that usually people want to adjust the most are the sound quality, which we had a couple hiccups with that earlier, but everything seems to be working fine now. If you do run into any sound problems, please let us know. We actually have two computers running, and if there's a problem, we'll switch from our primary computer to our backup. Usually everything runs fine. But every once in a while, we're at the mercy of technology. Um, the other thing that people want to adjust frequently is the video display or the screen display so that the slides take up the full screen so that you're not seeing the black box that has my name on it, Robert Kellerman. If you want to adjust that, you can either minimize that, you can hit the X button and exit out, or you can drag it down to the bottom of the screen. You can also go into view options and click the side by side mode. Um, throughout the program tonight, if you have any questions or comments about Monet, feel free to type those in the Q&A section. And again, if you run into any technical problems, please let us know. We have a tester um, standing by, um, but it's always good to hear feedback from other people of anything that might be going on. So let's go ahead and get started. So again, this is 50 New York paintings. We're going to try and record this program. Um, sometimes when we do that, it works out fine and sometimes not. So we'll try and record this, and if you want to listen to it later or you know someone else that does, um, we'll pass that along. So we'll keep our fingers crossed and see how that works out. For those of you not familiar with our organization, we're Washington, D.C. History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization. And back in the day before COVID, we used to do tours and walks and all different types of things in person in Washington, D.C. But of course, all of those are on hold now because of the COVID situation. And then three times we actually organized group trips up to New York City to visit the art museums and the history museums and all that kind of stuff. So we'll continue doing that at some point in time in the future. And for those of you I haven't met before, my name is Robert Kellerman. I grew up in Detroit. I have a bachelor's degree in art history from the University of Michigan. I spent the first two years of my career working at the Detroit Institute of Arts, and I subsequently worked at Strayer University and Johns Hopkins University. And for the past five plus years, I've been leading this nonprofit organization, Washington DC History and Culture. And this is me at the Smithsonian with Marilyn Monroe. Okay, so it was Claude Monet's birthday, 180th birthday, 15 days ago on November 14th, 1840. So we had a series of five programs this month that were celebrating Claude Monet. So this is the fifth of the five. If you missed any of these or want to join them again, we'll probably offer them again in next month in December, but we don't have the dates for those just yet. We're still updating our calendar. But again, Claude Monet was born on November 14th, 1840. So we're celebrating the 180th anniversary of his birthday. So we always like to make sure we don't just um, do entertaining type stuff. We always like to educate people at the same time. So we always consider our programs to be educational entertainment. So here's two trivia questions for you for Monet. And I know some of you that were on our previous program might know the answer to this. And if you do know the answer, don't blurt it out to your neighbor. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So how many paintings did Monet create? And what did he consider his masterpiece? So the masterpiece question will answer a little bit later, but as far as how many paintings he created, he did about 2000 oil paintings. Now he made a few other um, types of paintings like watercolors and things like that. And pastels, I mean, sorry, not watercolors. Um, and there's 50 of them in New York City. So if you are in New York City metro area or get a chance to visit there, you have a major opportunity to go see a lot of Monet paintings. And so with this presentation is tonight, pretend we're able to physically visit all the museums in New York City that have the 50 Monet paintings and we're able to see all of them. That's what we're going to do tonight, but in an online 
virtual type experience. Here's where the paintings are. There's 40 at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There's five at the Museum of Modern Art. There's three at the Brooklyn Museum, one at the Guggenheim, and one at the Frick. Now, these are the 50 that I know of, and I've been to New York City many, many times. However, I'm not a New Yorker. So if you know of any Monet paintings that are in one of the five New York City boroughs, um, let me know. Send me a Q&A section because I don't think there are any other ones. But that being said, sometimes um, different museums will have stuff that might not be uh, on our radar screen or might not have known about. So these are the 50 that I personally know of. But if you know of any other ones that are in New York City, um, please let us know. And so again, what we'll do is we'll go through the paintings. Now we're only going to be, our program tonight is scheduled for an hour and 40 minutes. So to talk about 50 paintings will be a little bit of a challenge. Some of them we're just going to kind of look at, um, and then we'll talk about some of the more noteworthy or interesting ones. So let's go ahead and get started with Claude Monet. So this is a famous print of Paris that was actually ironically made in 1840, the year that Monet was born. And Monet was born in Paris, he's a Parisian. However, he only spends a few years there and then his family moves to the north of France. Now, if you're looking at this painting and saying, gee, that doesn't look like Paris, I don't see the Eiffel Tower. It's because the Eiffel Tower hadn't been built yet in 1840, so no worries about that but it is a famous print of Paris and interestingly enough, it was created the year that Monet was born in 1840. So what we're gonna do is we'll go through the 50 paintings and gonna do that in chronological order. And I broke the paintings up kind of into um, chronological sections, so to speak. And so we're gonna first talk about the early years of Monet's career. This is a photo of him on the left as a young man of 25 years old. And in these programs, I always like to make sure I include pictures of the artist because so many times we've heard these people's names, but we don't know what they look like. Like if you had to describe Monet, would you be able to do so? A lot of people know what Vincent van Gogh looks like or Frida Kahlo or George O'Keefe but not so much for Claude Monet. So this is what he looked like when he was 25. And of all these 50 New York City paintings, there are seven of them that are from this time frame. So let's go through and look at those seven. And again, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to chime that in the Q&A section and we'll keep an eye on that as we go through the program. Now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, as you can imagine, they have a fabulous art collection with a lot of incredible artworks. and. This is one of their famous paintings from the year 1650. This is a Monet painting from the early, it's the earliest one of the 50 that we're going to be looking at tonight. It's from 1864. And this is another painting by Monet's friend Manet. And it was done two or three years later in 1866 or 1867. So the reason why I'm showing you these three paintings is that you line them up side by side, they all look very similar kind of stylistically. They're all an individual person. They all have a very dark background. The coloring has a lot of dark colors in it as far as grays and browns and blacks. And it's a solitary figure with kind of the uh, effect of light and shadow. So I wanted to show you this because number one, it's an interesting painting by Claude Monet, and it's the earliest of the 50 that are in New York City, but it also shows how traditional his artwork was early on in his career. So this is Monet, 1864, and just kind of for contextual purposes for our American friends out there, to give you a point of reference, the Civil War in the United States, of course, was fought between 1861 and 1865, so Monet would have made this towards the end of the Civil War, just to give you that historical context. Now, if you look at Monet's later work, which was very revolutionary and groundbreaking and very different than any other artist, um, when he made, say, these two paintings, you can see how things progressed over time. So if he would have stuck making the types of paintings like he did here, the center one, he probably would have been somewhat of a well-known artist, but he wouldn't have been Monet, this uh, iconic artist who really changed and revolutionized the art world. So he had to kind of uh, break out of tradition, so to speak. And we'll talk more about that as the program goes through tonight. There's the full view of the portrait. And this is actually his doctor, the doctor that he went to posed for him. And there's a close up. 
Okay, this is the next work. So again, in going through chronological order, this is also at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, if you haven't been on one of our programs before, what I do for all the paintings is I include the museum, where it's located at, the title of the work, um, the artist for all these, for the most part is gonna be Monet, of course, and then the year it was painted. So this is 1865, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This painting is a nice one, but there's nothing um, super extraordinary about it. So we'll just kind of continue on. You can see it's done in a traditional style. There's nothing really overly abstract about it or unusual about it. I'll let you take a look at that for a second. Okay, let's continue on. So again, Monet does these really um, well-known works. You've probably seen either these two paintings or something very similar to them um, throughout your uh, career as a art appreciation type person. And a big part of Monet's life um, is centered around things other than um, like gardens and flowers and stuff. So if you look at these five paintings, actually, if you look at these two, these are two of his later works. If you look at these two, and if you look at these five, is there anything similar between all seven of these paintings? There's like one kind of reoccurring uh, similarity that all seven of them have. And if you answered water, you would be correct. So Monet frequently has water in his paintings. And so that's kind of be one of our themes uh, tonight is the number of paintings that he actually has that feature water in them and to some extent or another. So here's our first five. And Monet is really fascinated by the water. He, for the most part, lives his entire life near either the ocean or a river or et cetera, et cetera. And you can see his fascination with water as we go through and look at the uh, artwork that he created. And I like to talk about that because people sometimes typecast Monet as, oh, he's the guy who made the flowers and the gardens and the landscapes and stuff like that. And he did do that, but he also made a lot of other types of artworks. And I want to make sure people appreciate that. Here is a painting called The Green Wave at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Here's the full view. Now, this is an area of northern France where Monet's father moved to when Monet was a young child. So his father was a merchant, a very successful businessman, and he was living in Paris. Uh, Monet is born and the father decides that the business will be even more successful if he relocates it to the north of France. They sold, he was a merchant and a lot of the things that they sold were maritime type supplies. And so being near the ocean, he thought would be better for his business. They move up there, his business becomes even more successful up there. So Monet's father is very wealthy. And Monet periodically would spend time um, staying with him as much as they did here. So this is the summer of 1867. Monet went to stay with his father. And while he's there, he paints these two paintings, which are both really nice. The one on the left is one of his more famous early works, but they're not overly impressionistic just yet. And oh, by the way, the painting on the left that's his father that's in the bottom right corner. So this is from 1867 at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now this is a painting or a print, sorry, by a Japanese artist called 36 Views of Mount Fuji. This was a whole series of woodblock prints that was done. And Monet, like many of the Impressionists, was very, um, intrigued and influenced by Japanese art. And this would have been a work that he was familiar with. Here's the full view of it. This particular version is at the Art Institute of Chicago, but this series of prints um, is held in a number of museums throughout the world. And then here's Monet's version. So you can kind of see some similarities. I mean, it's not the exact same uh, rendition, but you can see that, yeah, it, that might have had some influence on him. In fact, one of Monet's friends called this painting his Japanese painting, even though if you looked at it, you say, well, what's, what's so Japanese about it? The people aren't Japanese. It doesn't necessarily look like Japan. Well, it's because it was influenced by this, it's one of these well-known works from Mount Fuji. And then here's the two side by side. So you can see the kind of perspective of it is similar, although he's customized it for his own particular situation. If you're in this part of Northern France on the English Channel and you look out towards the water, 
you're not going to see Mount Fuji or any big mountain. So that's probably one reason why he had to take that part of the painting out and put something else like these boats out on the water. And there's a close up view. And more of a close up view. And again, that's his father in the top right corner. And then the full view. Now this um, painting on the left is also at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it's one of a series of two paintings that Monet, Monet did at the same time. And for these paintings, what I'd like to do is give you the historical context, um, connect it with other works of Monet that you may have seen or may be familiar with. So for our friends that are either in Chicago or have had the fortunate experience to visit the Art Institute Chicago, you may recognize the painting on the right. So this is part of a set of two paintings that he did at the same time. So the one on the left is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The one on the right is at the Art Institute of Chicago. Perhaps you like one of these two better than the other. Um, I happen to like both of them myself about the same, um, but I'm sure the New Yorkers are um, voting for the one on the left and the Midwesterners are voting for the one on the right. This was a regatta also from 1867. Again, he's staying with his father at this point in time. And then this is the beach. One thing noteworthy about this painting is look at how much uh, space of the painting he devotes to the sky. I'm guessing if you or I were to take a picture of this same scene with our phone, we probably would have had the display a little bit different. So the sky wouldn't have taken up so much of the painting. He's got it here about half the work. Um, and that's great. He wants to show you how beautiful the clouds are and what the sky looks like, but it's a little bit different of a perspective than say a regular person might have taken. And there's a close up of the people and a close up of the boats. And then the full view. Now this is another well-known painting in New York um, that Monet did. That's also at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So again, because 40 of the 50 paintings in New York City are at the Met, um, those were most of the ones we're gonna be talking about, but there's 10 other ones that are pretty cool. Um, now this one on the right was done by his very good friend Renoir. So Monet and Renoir were very, very good friends. They were almost like brothers and spent a lot of time together um, learning from one another, encouraging one another, comparing notes, so to speak on different painting techniques and styles. And frequently they would go to the same spot and paint the exact same scene. So this is the ex exact same view done at the exact same time by two well-known impressionists, Monet and Renoir. And so you can also look at this one and say, hmm, which one do you like better? The one on the left or the one on the right? I won't answer that for myself. So this is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art done in 1869. And again, there's water again in the painting. And then here's Renoir's version. Now, if you're wondering what's going on in the painting, like what, the, what are these people doing? This was a resort area outside of Paris. And so during the mid 1800s, there's a real expansion in the middle class. And so with that comes people have more leisure time to do things like boating and go to parks and all those types of fun things instead of just, you know, working six or seven days a week. And so that's what Monet and Renoir are capturing. So this was a resort area that was along the water. And you could go here and you could rent a canoe um, or a sailboat. You could go on a picnic and you could have a lunch and things like that. So here's two historical photographs that show you what the area looked like. And then here's an advertisement for it from back in the day. Um, so it looks like a fun place to go hang out uh, once you got off work for the evening or for the weekend. Um, and so this is the place that Monet and Renoir are depicting. Um, notice the swimsuits, they look somewhat similar, but yet uh, somewhat different at the same time. And then again, if you look on the left side of the print in the middle, you can see there's a gentleman who's um, paddling a canoe and people swimming. And so this is the place that Monet ends up painting. He thinks it would be a good uh, subject matter. And him and Renoir go down and check it out. 
Now, this is a view of modern day Netherlands, if you recognize the windmills on the right side of the picture. And why am I showing you this all of a sudden? Well, because Monet visits uh, the Netherlands in 1871 and spends time there painting some of the scenery. So he spends several weeks there um, going around depicting different things. Uh, Monet is actually pretty well traveled for someone of his day. He's not only, he was born in France, but during his lifetime, he visits London on several occasions, which we'll talk about later. He visits Venice, which we'll talk about later. He visits the Netherlands, so, and also Italy. So a pretty well-traveled guy. And here's the close-up view. And then a further close-up view. Okay, so that was Monet's early part of his career. Let's kind of talk about kind of um, the second quarter of his career, so to speak. And so these are the years 1871 to 1883. He was between 31 and 43 years old. And we'll explain what the happened to his life in 1883 that caused us to break there. And during this time frame, he makes 20 of the 50 paintings we're going to be looking at. And that's actually a self-portrait that Monet made. Uh, he only made two self-portraits during his lifetime. This is one of them. And then the one where I was showing you earlier that had like the trivia questions on Monet, that was the other one that he did. This is Monet's son, Jean, and he paints this in 1872, also at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is one of my favorite Monet paintings. It's just really cute and adorable. I'm surprised this one is not more well known. I think it's not because it's not a really cool painting. I think it's just because Monet made so many hits, so to speak, that they all can't be the most popular one or the most well-known one. But I would think if a lesser artist would have painted this exact same painting, that it would have been one of their more well-known ones because Monet has so many hits, it's kind of been lost in the shuffle to a certain degree. I mean, it's, it's not an unknown painting, um, particularly because it's his son. But if you had to list like the top 10 most well-known paintings of Monet, this one probably would not be on the list, but it is a really cool one. Here's a close-up. And he's riding on his hobby horse on the garden at their home. Now, speaking of family, this is Monet's wife, and she's sitting on a park bench. This was done in 1873. Now, this is a little bit of an unfortunate painting because if you look at her, she has a pretty uh, solemn expression on her face. Uh, sometimes when Monet painted her, she's either smiling or she's got kind of a neutral expression. This one, she doesn't look too happy. Uh, the reason being is her father had just passed away. Um, so I'm actually surprised that Monet painted her during this time of sorrow. Um, so that's partially to explain the expression on her face. And then these are two neighbors that are with her. So the woman in the background, kind of by the flower garden, uh, that's a garden that Monet spent time on. And then the gentleman on the right, is also a neighbor and supposedly he brought these flowers over to kind of cheer her up. But that's the story behind this one. This is called Spring Fruit Trees in Bloom from 1873. So we're not gonna talk about all these paintings, kind of think like if we were actually at the museum going on a tour, um, we would walk by some paintings and kind of point them out like, hey, there's such and such, we wouldn't stop at every single one. And so that's kind of what we're gonna have to do with some of these paintings because we just don't have time to talk about every single one, but we'll pick some of the more noteworthy ones and spend a little bit more time on that. Um, and again, I wanted to kind of give you the comparison and contrast kind of contextually of maybe some of the more well-known Monet paintings that you might be familiar with and how they might be, or, or paintings at other museums, maybe where you've either lived at or that you've been to on your travels um, and kind of see how they connect with the paintings in New York. So this one on the left is at the Musée d'Orsay. It's one of Monet's most famous paintings. And there's a very similar one that was done around the same time frame at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The one in Paris is called Poppy Field. Guess what the one on the right was called? Poppy Fields near Argentoy. So Argentoy is northwest of Paris. Now it's pretty much a suburb of Paris, but when Monet was alive, um, it was kind of more of a separate small town. Eventually the 
Parisian sprawl kind of um, engulfed it. But when Monet is living there, it's a little bit more of a rural type of area. And so he's able to walk from his home and go find these poppy fields and other things that provided the subject matter for his paintings. So like this one and this one. Done around the same time in his life. And so this is one of the things that Monet does. He, um, he spends a lot of time at home painting scenes in his garden, but he also spends a fair amount of time kind of exploring the countryside outside of the different homes where he lives at looking for interesting subject matter. And so this struck his fancy. Now, Monet has many friends that are also artists. Remember before I talked about his relationship with Renoir, where they would frequently go out and paint together. Well, another one of his friends was Manet, uh, the fellow Impressionist. And Manet ended up one day going over to Monet's house, and he ends up doing a painting of Monet, his wife, and their son. And so this is called the Monet family in their garden at Argentoy. Uh, and this was done in 1874. So it's not a work by Monet, but it's a painting of Monet. So I thought we included it in our presentation. Actually, let me go back. Initially, Manet did not like Monet because Manet was a more of an established artist first before Monet came along. And then when um, Monet started issuing paintings, people got the names mixed up and they thought the Monet paintings were done by Manet, which upset Manet because he wasn't a famous artist, but he was more established than Monet was. And so he used to get really upset when people would confuse the two of them. He's like, listen, I'm not Monet, I'm Manet. Uh, so he was not happy about that. But eventually he meets Monet um, and Monet was a pretty friendly guy and they end up actually becoming friends. But kind of funny initially, uh, Monet did not think too highly of, or Manet did not think too highly of Monet, but they became friends later on. Thus this painting of the family. And this is at Monet's house or outside of his house. And it's the only painting of Monet working in his garden. There's picture, there's photographs of Monet working in his garden. And there's a lot of different paintings by other artists of Monet. But this is the only painting of Monet working in his garden. And his buddy Manet did it. And there's his wife and son again, just chilling out. This is also a picture of Monet's garden. That's their house in the background that you can kind of see through the trees and the flowers. And if you look closely on the left side, that's his wife. And so Monet and his wife were very close and she ended up being the model in a number of his early paintings. This was done in 1876. It's the same time frame, the same house. Um, and notice the difference here. Remember I showed you this picture earlier, which was when she was in mourning. And then the picture three years later, um, I like doing these compare and contrast because look at how much more um, impressionistic or how abstract the one on the right is compared to the left. So you can see the, his career is starting to kind of change trajectory, so to speak, in terms of doing the impressionist type style. There's just a three year difference between these two paintings. The one on the left is from 1873 and the one on the right is from 1876. Now Monet lives to be 86 years old and he paints for over 70 years or makes art, I should say, for over seven years. So it's not surprising that over time, his career um, and style and whatnot would change from time to time just because, I mean, he did something for so long. I mean, if you do something for 10 or 20 years, uh, potentially you might have some changes in the way you do it. And the same thing is true for Monet. Although in this particular instance, there's only a three-year difference between these two. But a lot can happen in three years as we've all learned the past um, <laughs> 10 months or so. And there's a close-up. This is a park that was outside of Paris that Monet frequented. It was kind of, it's still there. Um, it's a kind of an English type looking park. It's a little bit different. It's not your typical French kind of design. Here is Monet's painting. You can, again, you can tell very impressionistic in style. It's not, it's just not trying to make it look like a photograph or anything like that. And then here's another view of the park with some people included in it. It's like they're just hanging out. Yeah. 
and a close up. Okay, so remember before I was talking about Monet and water. And yeah, that's like a reoccurring theme. So even in this next section, um, look at the number of paintings that we're going to be talking about that include water of some type. Now, you might not be able to tell these are water depending on the size of your screen um, or and stuff like that. But suffice to say, all nine of these paintings have some type of water feature in them. So just really incredible um, that he's got that type of uh, interest in water. And again, he always spends his time living uh, near the water or close by the water, etc. Et Hold on for five seconds while I check something on my computer. Okay. This is a winter scene, thus the white and gray colors. And then these are also water scenes. So this is a city or a town called Vitoy. It's also not too far from Paris. This is Vitoy in the summer from 1880. Just to give you a frame of reference, Van Gogh started painting in, or making artwork, I should say, in the early 1880s. And he died in 1890s, just to kind of give you that frame of reference between him and Monet. So this is the scene today along the river. Looks pretty nice, huh? Nice quaint French town to go visit and along the river. And then one of the things that's really neat about the well-known French painters is depending on where you're at, oftentimes the local government or the tourist association or whatnot will put up historical markers so that you can kind of figure out hey where were actually some of these paintings that no like obviously they can't do this all the time but there's quite a few monet paintings where there's a historical marker where it was created to kind of give you an indication of the spot and so if you look at this painting or picture i mean and you see the blue arrow you can see the historical markers there and they even set it up like an easel aha and there it is. And so uh, there's the easel. It's actually a historical marker <laughs> that they've set up. And so Monet makes a whole series of paintings from this general vicinity. And that's what this is pointing out. And then the blue arrow kind of keep an eye or kind of remember what that building looks like because it's included in a number of the paintings. In fact, if we back up, you can see it right there in the kind of the middle section of the painting. And then you can see it there. Here's another view. This is the pathway up towards the river. So again, this is just a park that's along the river. This, is, this isn't like a major um, metro area, so there's a lot of open spaces. There's the full view of the painting. There's the close up. And then if you look closely, um, again, depending on the size your screen is, if you look in the center of the, this picture or this image, um, you can see the building with the steeple. Here's another view, same area from 1880. Very impressionistic style. Here's another view, same area, it's the river. One thing about Monet is even though he's born in Paris and he would live there the first um, few years of his life as a baby and then periodically throughout his life he would live there as an adult but for the most part he's not really a city guy he prefers to kind of be out in the country he likes nature and flowers and walking in gardens and parks and things like that um, and so the places that he's lived for most of his life is places outside of the Paris uh, metro area, so to speak. Thus, there's all these landscape type paintings. Now, a sad event happens on September 5th, 1879. That's when Monet's wife Camille passes away. Um, so this was a real shocking blow for him. Uh, that was the love of his life. 
They had two children together. He did numerous paintings of her. She was very supportive of his career. And it's unfortunate she never got to see him become this world-renowned artist. At this point in time, he had been supporting um, his family as a painter. And it was kind of hit or miss. He was selling paintings, um, but it wasn't quite consistent um, on a regular basis. In fact, he actually went through uh, quite a few stretches where he was really, really broke um, and on the verge of having some serious um, financial problems. He had a lot of conflicts with his father. His father was a very wealthy businessman and what he wanted Monet to do was to take over the family business and be a businessman like he was. Um, but Monet had zero interest in doing that. He always wanted to be an artist from the time he was a teenager. It caused a huge amount of conflict between him and his father. Um, in fact, such the extent that Monet's father um, did not even come to his, way, his son's wedding. Um, so imagine that. Now, there were points in times where they kind of patched things up periodically, but it was a challenging relationship between Monet and his father. Monet's mother passed away when he was a teenager, and then he loses his wife. Um, so this is a really challenging time for him. He was actually suffering a great deal of depression. He was wondering what he was going to do. Um, he, at this point in time, He's 39 years old. His career, while he's been painting for 20 years professionally, um, it's really been hit or miss as far as selling paintings. Um, he's pretty much broke and he's just lost his best friend and the love of his life, his wife. And he's also got two children he's got to figure out how to take care of. So this is a really challenging time for Monet uh, in 1879 but he sticks with it and he continues on making his paintings and this is another series that Monet frequently makes especially early on in his career or like in the early and mid parts of his career still lifes um, so still lifes are kind of indoor scenes of fruit and flowers and things like that and so these are three paintings that he did that are in New York this one is called apples and grapes so he made this in the months following his wife's death so Monet frequently would paint outdoors, um, but sometimes the weather is just too bad. It's either raining or it's cold <laughs> or it's snowing. And yeah, maybe you might be able to go outside and do a little bit of work, but um, what, what are you gonna do if you're an artist and you paint outdoors um, and the weather's bad? Well, you would come inside and make some still lifes like you did for this one. And I'm sure too, after his wife passed away, he maybe was not as interested in kind of going outside and walking around because frequently in the past his wife would have gone with him in fact she's included in a number of his paintings but she's not there anymore there's the close-up this is one of two beautiful flower paintings that are at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is called Bouquet of Sunflowers. This is from 1881. Monet was an avid gardener. He actually got these flowers from his own garden and you might have thought that Van Gogh was the only one that painted sunflowers. <laughs> Not true, although Van Goghs are a little bit more well known. And there's the full view. And the close up. This is so impressionistic. If you looked at this, um, I would think a lot of people might actually think this is a Van Gogh painting because it does look very similar stylist. Actually, let me go back. It does look a little bit similar stylistically. I mean, you can see some differences um, between the ones from Van Gogh on the right. All five of those paintings on the right are from Vincent Van Gogh, and the one on the left is from Monet. So you can see some similarities, but you can also see some differences too. And I won't bother to ask you which one you like better. This is another beautiful painting at the Met called Chrysanthemums from 1882. There's the full view. Now I wanted to blow up on this. Look at the work that he had to do to make that furniture um, look polished and shining. Uh, it took a fair amount of effort to make that look realistic. Uh, and then of course the flowers are also beautiful. And there's a famous quote by Monet. He says, I perhaps owe having become a painter to flowers. So how many guys out there do you know that their love of flowers um, influenced their career choice? Well, Monet was one of them, so there you go. And then there's the two side by side, but two beautiful paintings. These also, um, I'm surprised they're not more well-known. Like if you're a, a 
astute art person and know a lot about Monet, you might have seen these before, but I'm guessing if I uh, walked up to a hundred random people in an art museum uh, and asked them, or in a shopping mall and asked them who made these two paintings, they might not guess Monet. Now, here's a pretty well-known work of Monet's. This is a young couple, two ladies walking on a cliff along the ocean in Northern France. And this is also one of Monet's well-known works. This is at the Art Institute of Chicago. He made this painting in 1882. You may have seen this one before. It's also one of his, um, one of his many hits from his midpoint of his career. And this was in Northern France where these paint, this painting was made and some other ones I'm gonna show you next. And so this was as always for the longest time in a resort area. And this is a colored postcard um, that was from that area to kind of give you a sense of what the beachfront would have been like back at that point in time. So going to the beach as a pastime is not a modern uh, excursion by any means. And this is what the area looks like uh, in more recent times. And what's noteworthy in this photo is the cliffs. And so this particular part of the French coast, this is again in the northern France along the uh, English Channel, uh, it's very rocky and it's got this really high cliff line. And so this is the spot where Monet is making these paintings. So the one on the left is at the Art Institute Chicago, and then the other three are all in New York City. And so I wanted to give you that kind of um, frame of reference in case you've seen the one on the left before. So this one is at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to Brooklyn, check out the Brooklyn Museum. There's a lot of cool things to do um, in Brooklyn. I know most tourists end up just kind of going to Manhattan or staying in Manhattan, but there's a lot of other fascinating things to see in the other four boroughs. And for those of you not familiar with New York, what are the five boroughs of New York? You have Manhattan, Brooklyn, what are the other three? Queens, uh, the Bronx, uh, Staten Island. Okay, there you go. There's your five uh, boroughs of New York City. And so this one is at the Brooklyn Museum. This one is at the Museum of Modern Art. And this one's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Again, all done around the same time frame. There's the full view of this one. Those are sailboats out on the water. That's just the card for the caption, so we'll skip over that. Now, this is another part of the northern France shoreline that's really fascinating. So Monet made two um, similar paintings, a little bit apart from one of these. These weren't done at the exact same time, but they were um, not too far apart. And here's what that coastline looks today. So it's a really uh, distinguished um, feature uh, of the coastline. And again, this is in Northern France. So there's a photograph of what it looks like. Here's another view. So there's all these kind of rocky outcroppings um, and Monet was really fascinated by this particular area. And he makes a whole, whole series of these types of paintings. So this one was done in 1883. And there's the full view. And then this one done in 1886. And the later is, he gets kind of an idea for doing different versions of it. So we've kind of already seen a little bit of that. And then this is another example. So they call these the Monet series paintings. And this is a kind of a good example, a good early example of him doing that. So you have the same seen this one and then this one. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to show you what this spot or area or subject looks like at different times of day or different seasons of the year or different atmospheric conditions like on a sunny day or an overcast day and things like that. Okay, let's do this. I've been speaking for a little bit. Let's take a quick um, five minute break. You can grab a snack or a beverage and we'll continue back here. We're probably about maybe two thirds of the way through our program. So just like when you go to the symphony, they have a little bit of an intermission so you can go um, take care of your personal business. So let's do the same thing. Um, we'll come back in five minutes. We only have a minute 
left of our break, I'll make an announcement so you can come back and make sure you're here on time. Um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to type those in the Q&A section, and I will see you back here in just a little bit. So while we're waiting, we won't get started for maybe, I don't know, two or three minutes. So while we're waiting, let me answer a few questions that have come up um, from people in the audience. So thanks for, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to type in the Q&A. And let's see, someone asked, uh, Ginger asked, who put the, who painted the sunflowers first, Monet or Van Gogh? So Monet made that one first um, and Van Gogh had not seen it, but because he, he was in the south of France when um, Monet ended up making that painting, but his friend Gauguin saw it um, and told him about it. So Monet made his sunflower painting first, um, and then Van Gogh made his subsequently. Who? And then someone else asked, how do the paintings get named? That's really a complex um, answer for any artist. Sometimes the artists name them Sometimes their dealers will name them afterwards. Sometimes people at the museums that own the paintings will tweak the name or come up with the name. So really, the name of the paintings comes kind of from all sorts of 
nice detail on the slides. It's a noteworthy part of the painting because otherwise it's just too much um, information to process, so to speak. Um, let's see what else. Someone asked, was Monet's father alive when he became famous? No, he did not. His father passed away. Um, Monet's father passed away before he became a famous painter, but Monet did become a famous, well-known, and very wealthy painter during the later um, decades of his life. And let's see, Patricia asked, did Monet remarry? He did. We'll talk about his second wife. Um, her name was Alice a little bit later. Let's see, Monet did, Monet, yes, Monet did live a long time. He lived to be 86. And then another question from Lee, were Monet's paintings done outside or in the studio? So the, the ones where they're outdoor settings, he, for the most part, did outside. However, he was not um, opposed to doing as much outside as he could and then take them back indoors to his studio and kind of um, tweak them or uh, make changes to them, et cetera, et cetera. So a little bit of both, but for the most part, his, out, his paintings of outdoor scenes are done outdoors. Let's see, so when I was answering the questions, my head was turned a little ways from the speaker. Um, so that might have impacted the sound, unfortunately. So I'm kind of facing the regular main computer now. So are you all still able to hear me okay? Oh, good. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think um, in the last couple minutes, the sound might have been off because I have two computers and they're, they're next to each other, but they're a little bit separated. So that was the story with that. So, okay, let's go ahead and continue on. Thanks for your questions and comments. Okay, so let's talk about the years 1883 to 1890. Monet was between 43 and 50 years old during this point in time. And of the 50 paintings in New York City, 10 of them are done at this point in time. And this is a photo of Mr. Monet himself. This is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This was done in 1884. This was on a trip to Southern Italy. So again, Monet travels a fair amount. He's, he's an interesting guy in that he's somewhat of a homebody. He likes staying at home um, and hanging out with his friends and family and making paintings, but then um, periodically he gets the itch to travel. So interesting kind of um, contradiction between those two. This is also from the south of Italy. And again, we don't have time to talk about every single one of these paintings in great detail, so we'll skip over these two. Now what happens with Monet is his first wife passes away and he had a patron of his that was very wealthy. This gentleman was a heir to a department store chain. And so this guy that becomes kind of a friend of Monet's um, ends up actually buying quite a bit of his paintings because he's pretty wealthy. And that's a good friend to have if you're an artist. Um, but what ends up happening is the French economy collapses during a recession. And this guy through various um, things that happen pretty much ends up losing all of his money. And so this guy goes from being Monet's patron slash friend, goes from being very wealthy to being broke um, in a very short period of time. And at this point, Monet and his wife have their two children and his friend or patron um, and his wife have six children. And when the guy loses all his money, um, Monet says, well, you know what, why don't we kind of combine our households and we'll all live under the same roof. It'll be kind of crowded, but it'll be a good way for us to save money because at this point in time, Monet doesn't really have a lot of money himself either. Um, he's not doing all that hot financially. So they decide to do that. 
then um, his wife ends up dying. She had um, she'd had a lot of medical issues the later years of her life, and she ends up having their second son. And that didn't directly attribute to her death, but it really kind of took a toll um, on her body. Uh, it, throughout most of history, women um, going through the childbirth process um, was oftentimes very detrimental to their health. I mean, it's still obviously a very um, significant event in a woman's life, but because of advances in modern technology, it's not nearly as risky uh, as it was in days gone by. And so Monet's wife has their second son. She's already in pretty bad health. And that really kind of um, exasperates the situation and then uh, several months later, she ends up dying. Now, his friend, the patron, that guy ends up <laughs> running off um, to the Netherlands and basically leaves his wife and their six kids behind. So you have Monet, the widower, with his two kids living under the same roof with his patron slash friend's wife. Um, and her six kids because her husband has ran off uh, and left her. And, and so over time, her Monet and the woman, her name was Alice, um, end up in a romantic relationship and they would eventually end up getting married. Um, so this story does have kind of somewhat of a happy ending. And so between the two of them though, um, they have eight kids. So it's almost kind of like the Brady Bunch um, type of deal, um, only except Monet has two sons and she has um, six kids of her own. So it's Monet, um, Alice, and their eight kids. Why they haven't made a TV show or a movie about that, I don't know, but maybe that's where they got the idea from the Brady Bunch, maybe, who knows. Um, but anyway, so this is his stepdaughter. Um, and Monet, again, was very distraught when his wife died because not only is she the love of his life and his wife, but she also was his most frequent model. Um, and so when she dies, he doesn't have that person. So he ends up starting to use frequently um, the stepchildren, including um, this young lady, Suzanne. And so this is a portrait of her from 1887. And again, her mom is Alice. And her father was the guy who was Monet's kind of patron who ran off. Now they start the romantic relationship and they get married, but the marriage is several years later. It's, it's kind of, it's, I'm giving you kind of the oversimplified <laughs> version. I'm giving you the Cliff's Notes version for the sake of time. There's a kind of a few more wrinkles to the story, but we'll save that for another day. There's a close up. Now, as these paintings that we've looked through this evening, noticed how many of them had people in them. Uh, and these are all friends or family members of Monet. So again, uh, I wouldn't want him to be typecast as the guy who paints flowers and gardens and landscapes. Because while he does do that, he paints many other types of things, whether it's scenes of water or still lifes or pictures with people in them. And so of the paintings that we looked at in New York, these are all the ones that had people in them. Now, some of the paintings, the, their portraits and the people are prominently displayed. Some of the other ones are just kind of accessories, so to speak. But suffice to say, in all these paintings, they have people in them. However, the ones we're going to be looking at tonight, this is the last one that actually has a person. And all the next paintings do not have any people in it. And that's really kind of... Um, uh, similar to Monet's overall career. He does paint people frequently in paintings from say the early to middle half of his career. Um, but the second half, really not all that much. And not that he doesn't like people. He is um, pretty friendly and he's not like the life of the party type of guy, but he is very friendly. People like him uh, they enjoy his company. He likes people as well. Um, but it's, so it's not that he doesn't like people anymore. It's just he doesn't want to focus on that. His, his, the sole focus of his attention artistically later in his career is the depiction of light and how it interacts with nature and buildings and things like that. And while he does like people, he just kind of like, yeah, I've already been there, done that type of thing. So you don't see people frequently um, in the later stages of Monet's career and you won't see any more tonight after we say goodbye to his stepdaughter. So there's her. And again, there's all the paintings that have the people in them. And again, notice these people are all close, those close to Monet. So in the top left, you had his doctor. Um, in the middle, you had his father is included in there. Um, that's also, I think, a cousin in that painting. Um, over on the kind of the far right, you have his son. Then down on the bottom, uh, in the middle, you have his wife and then his um, step 
daughter. So again, lots of different friends and family members included the painting in the middle. Uh, he painted with his buddy Renoir. Um, that's also his wife on the picture that's in the second from the left in the top row. So again, friends and family really play an important role in Claude Monet's life. Okay, we keep talking about this water situation. So here's five more paintings we're gonna be seeing up ahead that all have water in them. Although you may not be able to tell that because some of them are very impressionistic in style. This is a scene of some rapids. This is in central France. Now notice we're getting up there in years. Remember we started out talking about Monet in the mid 1860s. We're now up to 1893. This is a painting of ice flows. It's very light in color, so don't, that's not your screen <laughs> being distorted. There's the full view. This is a winter scene, so of course it's whitish. This is a water scene, in case you can't tell. This is a morning view. And again, Monet's not trying to give you an exact depiction of what this scene looks like. He's more interested in depicting the light and how it interacts with the water and the nature. And here's all four of these paintings we just looked at all on the same screen. So you can see again, these are, you can tell he's kind of full-blown impressionist mode by now. He's not um, giving you as much detail as he did in some of the earlier paintings. Now these are three of Monet's many series. So what a series for Monet is where he comes up with an idea to paint the same subject over and over again. And he's going to show you the scene in different times of the day or different times of the year or different atmospheric conditions like a cloudy day versus a sunny day versus a rainy day, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so these are three, just three, there's many, many examples, but these are three examples of series that Monet did. The poplars on the left, the haystacks in the middle, and the Rouen Cathedral on the right. And he did a number of paintings of all three of these. So let's go look at the one they have in New York at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They have the four trees. So these are poplar trees. And what happened, this is a funny story. Um, this is on a property near where Monet was living. Now, the reason why we switched gears from 1883 forward is because 1883 is a really pivotal year in the life of Claude Monet. It's when he moves to Giverny, um, what would end up becoming his well-known estate. And he lives there for the second half of his life. But for the first seven years, he doesn't own that property. He's renting it. Um, and so, if you're familiar with all of Monet's um, garden at Giverny paintings, he does not end up doing those until he buys the property. And the reason being is because he, he doesn't start doing all the um, garden expansion and stuff until he actually takes ownership of the property. So for the first seven years or so that Monet is living in Giverny, he's not doing very many paintings at that site. He's going walking around um, in areas outside of his home base, so to speak, um, and looking for interesting subject matter. Thus, the haystacks and the poplars and the cathedral and stuff like that. So these um, paintings from this series have a funny story. He saw these trees, thought they were interesting, wanted to do a painting of them, but then he heard that they had been sold um, to a lumber uh, guy and they were going to be cut down and used for wood. And you're like, oh, no, 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 I haven't finished my paintings yet. Um, and so by this point in time, Monet's career has started to do well financially. And so he could afford to pay the lumber guy to basically hold off cutting down these trees until he finished his painting. So kind of now what's uh, interesting is what did they use this wood for? Wouldn't that be cool if you knew like what happened to the wood that was in these trees? But I think that's been lost to history. I couldn't find the uh, evidence of where the trees went to. There's the full view. But again, this is one of many paintings that Monet did of poplar trees. This is another one of the series. This is called Haystack. So you may have seen a painting um, similar to this at a museum near you or on your travels, or if you're reading books or whatnot. Um, this is the one they have at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's called Haystack's Effect of Snow and Sun. Um, and he does, again, a number of these at all different types of day, climate, atmospheric conditions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's from 1891. 
Another noteworthy thing about Monet is quite a few of the Impressionists uh, do not do paintings outdoors in the winter, not to name anybody. Doors, <laughs> but if you look through this whole career, uh, in we've seen a number of paintings that he made during the winter months, which is not always the case for some of his fellow impressionists. I'm not a big fan of cold weather myself, so I'm not gonna shame anyone um, if they didn't make any paintings in the winter. So, uh, and this is his cathedral series. So Monet is an interesting guy in the sense that he really likes flowers and gardens and nature and landscapes and things like that. But he's also really fascinated in architecture. Um, he does not, live in cities very much in his life, but he does like visiting Paris and he really likes going to London. He's, if you look at his artwork, um, he spends a number of times making architectural types either, whether it's cathedrals or bridges or different types of buildings. And you can kind of see that um, again and again. And so that's the case here. So an interesting kind of contrast, a guy that likes flowers and gardens and nature and that kind of stuff, also really interested in architecture and buildings and uh, train stations and stuff like that. So this is the cathedral series. What he did for this one was there was, this is a well-known French cathedral. And what he did was there's a, um, there was a lingerie shop across the way from the cathedral and Monet rented space in that shop. And they had a partition set up so that he could paint there and both um, not be disturbed by the lingerie store customers, um, but then also not disturb them. Because I'm sure if you were a woman going in to buy lingerie, um, it maybe would have seemed kind of unusual to have this guy um, sitting there looking out the window painting the cathedral. But they put a partition up, so he didn't have to worry about that. And he paints a whole series of these works. He did most of the work um, at the site of the cathedral and then took all the paintings back home to his studio and kind of finished them up there. There's the full view of that. And again, here's the side by side. So this is kind of one of the characteristic Monet things. If you had to list like, I don't know, top things you should know about Monet, you should know that he frequently makes these series of paintings. This is not unique to him. Um, several other artists have done kind of similar things, but he did it quite frequently. Okay, let's talk about some of the later years of Monet's life. So we're coming into the home stretch. This is the final 13 paintings we're gonna be looking at. And we're talking about the later years of Monet's life. And again, the big event that takes place for him artistically is in 1883 when he moves to Giverny and he rents the property for seven years. Then he ends up, his finances improve and he ends up buying the place. Now, it's a kind of a complicated story about how he went from uh, rags to riches in terms of his artistic um, sales, so to speak. A uh, number of things happened to him. Number one is he just kept with his painting. And so think about it in your own life. If you do something for a number of years, over time, you're going to get better at it and better at it. And that's what happens with him. Um, another thing that happened was people's preferences changed over time. So initially, when Monet starts painting, uh, people are not interested in the Impressionist style work, not from him, not from anybody else. And so the early Impressionists most of them struggled financially unless they had some other means of income available to them because the paintings did not sell. But over time, over a series of many, many years, people's preference and interest change and people start to um, accept and embrace the Impressionist painting. So that's good for business, good for sales. Um, and then also Monet But it's kind of like a business um, advisor. So she gave 
Monet some insight who he should talk to as far as dealers and stuff like that. So there's kind of all these different things that take place that Monet's life ends up transitioning from being a starving artist who gets evicted from some of the places he lives at because he can't afford to pay his bills to the guy who's able to buy Giverny and he's able to spend a lot of time and money expanding the gardens and eventually he ends up actually having a team of full-time gardeners uh, working there on his estate. So it's a real kind of um, long process. It's not like a overnight thing like he won the lottery or anything like that. But let's talk about the last 13 paintings of his career. Um, starting in 1890, Monet passed away in 1926. And we're talking about him from the years of him being 50 to 86. And this is actually a colorized photo of him outside his garden at Giverny. If you look closely enough, depending on how big the screen is, you can see the Japanese footbridge in the back of the photo on the right side above his shoulder. FYI. Okay, so this is Monet and Water part four. So again, a uh, reoccurring theme for you to look for when you see any Monet paintings in the future is look to see if he has water in them because he frequently does that. These top two pictures are of London and the bottom three pictures are of Venice. Remember what Monet's a pretty well-traveled guy for his day. Do you recognize this building in London? Hmm, what could that be? It's the House of Parliament. So um, obviously the most well-known buildings in London and was there of course during Monet time. And again, he's really fascinated by architecture. And so he likes going to London for extended period of time. He would went there every year um, for several weeks at a time over a several year period. And London has a really fascinating relationship with Claude Monet because he's French and traditionally the British and the French have kind of a uh, somewhat uh, friendly rivalry, kind of like two brothers, so to speak. But London's almost kind of like adopted uh, Monet just because he liked the city so much. He ended up living there on two different occasions. He lived there briefly as a young man for several months, and then he would go back there um, on a regular basis later on in his career um, and paint a lot of the architectural features like the House of Parliament or the bridges and et cetera, et cetera. So um, London is kind of almost semi-adopted um, Monet, <laughs> even though he was a Frenchman. So this is at the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, again, if you go to New York, make sure you check out things outside of Manhattan because there's a lot of really cool stuff to see and do. This is one of their paintings, Houses of Parliament, Sunlight Effect. And this one's at the Met, House of Parliament Effect of Fog. And here's an example of, again, um, the Londoners um, embracement of Claude Monet, where they have one of his paintings on the travel magazine. So I thought I would share that with you. I'm guessing there is point in times in British history where they definitely would not have put a French person on the cover of one of their travel magazines. But things the, the, in, in modern times, the relationship has been great, but there have been a few challenges over the years. But fortunately, everything's good now. Of course, you can say that about a lot of, <laughs> a lot of countries. And this is the House of Parliament, a more recent photo. Really spectacular. And here is Monet's painting. Now, I don't know when they took this photo. I went to London a few years ago. Uh, and the first time I went, I wanted to take some pictures and send back to my mom. And I was there for like I think I was there for like a little over two weeks and I kept waiting for the sun to come out so I could take a nice picture of this building with me in it uh, and send it to my mom. Well, the sun wasn't out and I was like, well, maybe tomorrow. And then I'd waited and well, it didn't come out today, maybe the next day. And you know, one thing, they'll do another. Next thing you know, I'm there for two weeks and it never really had any good weather. And that was March. Um, and Monet was going at different times of the year, but sometimes in the winter as well. And, but eventually, I just had to bite the bullet and take some pictures and it was a little bit overcast, but um, this picture on the bottom was probably more of a summer type view, um, whereas Monet is sometimes going there in the winter and so when he's there it's overcast sometimes and raining and foggy and cloudy and stuff like that and he's really capturing that in some of these paintings that he did and so what's another interesting point is the most famous part of this building is on the far right, Big Ben. But notice that Monet doesn't even include that in his painting. Well, why wouldn't he do that? I mean, if you're taking a photo, if you or I were going to take a photo, we would probably do like the one on the bottom. We'd want to capture the whole entire thing. Well, the reason why Monet doesn't include it is because he's not trying to give you a depiction 
of what the building actually looks like. Monet's thought is, you know what, if you want a exact image of what this building looks like, you can go get one of these photographs. I'm not a photographer, I'm a painter. And so what I wanna do is I wanna show you what the building looks like under different light and atmospheric conditions. And so that's what he's doing. And potentially he probably thought about not including Big Ben because when you look at the photo, that's where your eye instantly goes to. It immediately goes from left to right. Oh, okay, yeah, there's that. And he thinks, you know what, if I just chop that off, it won't be distracting people from my work. They can just focus on the painting itself. And so there's one, and there's the other, and very abstract. Someone, um, a couple people asked questions about Monet's eyesight. His eyesight does get very bad, um, but more so than the years after this. Um, his, but his eyesight did get very, very bad, but that wasn't really an issue too much at this point in time. Uh, Monet also goes to Venice with his second wife, Alice. They took the train there, and here are three paintings in New York City that you can check out all of similar views. He, Monet um, spent several weeks in Venice. He was invited there by one of his friends. He paints a number of different things in the city. It just so happens that these three paintings in New York are all pretty much of the same view, but I wouldn't want you to leave this presentation thinking like this is the only thing he painted in Venice because he painted a number of different um, structures. There's a painting that Monet made, for instance, that's at the National Gallery of Art. That's a completely different building. This is the building, you might have recognized it, one of the more well-known ones if you've been to Venice. This one is at the Guggenheim Museum, another fabulous museum in New York City. It's the building that's um, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. This is their contribution to the Monet presentation tonight. This one's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this one's at the Brooklyn Museum again. And then here's our more modern photo. And so let's do this. Let's look at the Monet paintings compared to the modern photo. And again, he's not trying to give you an exact depiction of what the building looks like. He's more focused on how does the light interact with the building and how does the light interact with the water and the changes that take place at different points in time. Here's another comparison. And here's another comparison. Monet and Venice. Now, Venice ended up actually being somewhat of a sad trip for Monet because it was really the last uh, trip that him and his wife Alice went on. They returned back to France um, and not, uh, not right away, but eventually um, in the not too distant future, she ends up passing away. So Monet, the guy, he ended up outliving his mom, his dad, his older brother, um, two wives, and one of his two children. So Monet was a real um, longevity guy. But this was the last trip that he took with Alice. And pretty much after returns back to France, um, he does not really leave home all that much because he had to figure at this point in time, he's getting up there in years himself. He's not a young guy anymore. There's the full view, another full view, another full view. So again, Monet and water. Okay, so we've looked at a lot of impressive paintings by Claude Monet. What did he consider his masterpiece? Now, if some of you have been on one of our earlier Monet programs, you're gonna know the answer to this one, but if you haven't, what did he consider his masterpiece? His garden. Wow, imagine that. Claude Monet makes 2,000 paintings, uh, considered one of the most influential, popular artists in history, and his masterpiece isn't even one of his paintings. It's his garden. Wow, imagine that. Who would have thought that? So FYI, direct quote from Claude Monet himself. Why did he consider his masterpiece to be his garden? because it was so spectacular, that's why. Um, so he moves into this house and it already does have a garden to it, but Monet spends a huge amount of time um, investing monetary resources, time, effort um, to make it even more expansive and spectacular. This is a color photo of him. This is, all these photos I'm showing you of Claude Monet were all initially black and white photos. But what people do now is they take 
black people that are experts in this type of thing, they'll take black and white photos and they'll make them color, they'll colorize them. So just FYI, all these pictures that you've seen tonight were initially black and white photos that have been colorized. And so they're guessing this is what the garden would have looked like in terms of the color scheme. Um, so again, Monet spends the second half of his life in Giverny. He lives to be 86. He spends the first 40 years, 43 years other places, the second 43 years at Giverny. The first seven years though, he was renting the place and he doesn't really go gung-ho on the gardens until he's able to come up with enough money to actually buy property. Um, and over time, much every day, until the end of his life. By the time he died, he was actually very wealthy. So he was starving. Once again, this is a picture of what it looks like today for those of you who have not been to Giverny. And the most noteworthy feature is this lily pond. So there was a small pond there emphasis on the word small when he bought the property and he made an effort to greatly expand it. So um, I don't even know if I would call this a pond. It's kind of more like a small lake, uh, actually. Um, when I think of a pond, I think of something like, I don't know, five or 10 feet across. And um, as you can see, if you look close enough, depending on the size of your screen, um, you can see some people in the background. Just so if you haven't been here before, um, so just to kind of give you a sense of that. And so here we are, I hate to keep beating home the same issue, but here we are, more paintings of water featuring Monet. I should have went through and counted how many of the 50 had water. It's probably like, um, I don't know, 70 or 80 percent, if I had to guess, at least in, in terms of this presentation. Um, and this is a quick map. So uh, this is France. And if you look at the kind of the center of the map, you see Paris. And then if you kind of move up to the top left, um, there's a, along the coastline is La Havre. That's where Monet moved to when he was a young boy. And then the blue dot is where Giverny is. Now, for the most part, Monet spends almost his whole entire life in between living in places in between Paris and the northern coast of France. So he's pretty much always near the water, um, partially uh, just by chance or coincidence, partly because he likes the water so much. So that's kind of one reason why you see so much water included in his artworks. So let's go through some of these paintings. This is one of the most uh, famous ones we've seen tonight. This is a Bridge Over a Pond of Water Lilies. This is a Metropolitan Museum of Art. done in 1899. Uh, and again, look when Monet is born in 1840. So he's 59 years old when he paints this. And this is actually a picture of him uh, kind of in a similar spot. So again, this is another black and white photo that someone took the time to colorize. You can get a sense of what it looks like. Looks very similar to the painting. Now he was much older when this photograph was taken. And also to uh, the bridge now at Giverny is much closer to the water uh, for uh, various reasons, including tourist safety. Here's the painting, the full view. Now let's do this. Let's take this painting and let's divide it into two. Let's look at the top half and then we'll look at the bottom half. So here's the full painting. Here's the top half, which is this uh, Japanese style footbridge. Monet actually had this installed. He's really intrigued by um, a lot of different Japanese things. Remember before I showed you the Japanese print? This is the Japanese style footbridge he had put in place. But look at the bottom of the painting. So this actually looks like a Monet painting just looked like, like this, just this section. And so that's actually what he would end up doing. If you look at Monet's later works of the pond, uh, at Giverny, he does not include the bridge anymore. And so here's one example that we're gonna look at in more detail. And here's another one. So again, let me scroll back. This is the, you can always tell these Monet uh, paintings of his garden, for the most part, the ones that have the bridges in them are the earlier ones, not always. He did a few um, a little bit later, which I'll show you an example of one of them. But for the most part, the bridges or the paintings that have the bridge in them are usually early, earlier in the series. And so 
later on, he says, you know what? I don't want the bridge anymore. I just want the water lilies. And so that's what he does. So this is the bottom half of that painting. This is a subsequent painting. Notice there's no bridge. This is another subsequent painting, also no bridge, of course, because it's very close up. And again, this is what the water lily pond uh, looks like today. Here's another view, just really spectacular. And a key feature is these water lilies. And so again, when he moves into this place, there is a really small pond, um, emphasis on the word small. Over time though, he greatly expands it um, through different resources. He actually had the river um, flow into here so he could get more water in here. And he has all these water lilies um, added and he expands the plantings around the pond. So he really wants this to be um, a spectacular source of inspiration, which it was. Um, this is a painting at the Metropolitan Museum Art called Waterloo. Now this is 1919. This is a little bit later in Monet's career. These ones in this section aren't necessarily all in chronological order. I said that I put them kind of more by uh, thematic. This one is from the Metropolitan Museum Art also. It's called Water Lilies as well. And again, here's the three. So the early Monet works at Giverny typically have the bridge in them. Uh, that's a kind of a common reoccurring theme in this series of paintings that he did. And then the later ones, um, they don't usually, usually don't, not always, but usually don't. Monet is an interesting artist because you can, up, if you know a little bit about his work, like I'm guessing if you sat through this presentation and then you go to an art museum next week and someone tells you, hey, there's a Monet painting on the wall over there, that you could kind of look at it after sitting through this presentation and kind of guess like, oh, I bet that was done around, you know, such and such early in his career or later in his career, just by looking for these kind of characteristics you can key on. There's the early one. Here's a close up, but photograph of the water lilies. So this is what Monet really decided to focus his attention on with his paintings later on. Looks very similar. Not exactly the same, but you can kind of get the idea, right? You can see the flowers on the painting and the flowers on the photograph. Alex just asked if the shark, if there are sharks in the pond. I don't think so, but that, you know, that might be a good idea because there's a lot of tourists, Alex. So, but I, I don't think there's any sharks <laughs> in the pond, but thank you for that question. I appreciate that. And here's another close up of the water lilies. Notice the mirror like surface of the water. And, you know, that would be really challenging to be a painter and try and capture that and make it look uh, realistic, but Monet is a talented guy. He's up to the challenge. Uh, this is a close-up of the water lilies. I like these paintings, and they're pretty popular for most people because of the beautiful colors, the blues and the greens, includes the flowers in there with some reds and whites and stuff. Now, there's some other paintings he did around this time frame that are kind of adjacent type subjects. So well, the nice thing about these museums in New York, they have some of these other paintings. Sometimes, you know, when you go to a museum, if an art museum has like one Monet painting, they're doing good because there's only, even though there are 2000 of them, they're scattered all over the world. Some of them are held by private individuals. Um, some of them are concentrated in a you know, few museums like the Met has 40. Um, so whenever a museum has one Monet painting, that's really something to celebrate. But the advantage of going here to New York is you can see so many of them. I forgot to mention, you would be familiar with this if you go to museums on a regular basis, but for some reason you don't, you're not going to probably be able to see all these paintings at any given time because what happens with a museum is they usually don't display all the works they have because number one, museums almost always have more artwork than they have space to display it with. Um, and number two, frequently they'll rotate the painting. So sometimes they might send a painting out to a special exhibit somewhere, or they might have to take it inside to their conservation department and kind of clean it up or work on it. So um, you're probably never going to be able to see all 50 of these paintings all at the same time. And you, if you go to museums on a regular basis, you probably already know that. But if you don't, um, just FYI. I once met a woman from Japan and she had come to the National Gallery of Art and I was talking to one of the security guards 
and she had this really distraught look on her face. Like I thought maybe, uh, you know, her purse got stolen or she lost her phone or something. And so the, my security guard friend and I at the National Guard, are we, you know, are you okay? What, what, what's wrong? And she held up the, uh, her phone and showed us a picture and she says, where's this painting at? Uh, it was a Monet painting at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. And we said, um, oh, you know, they actually just sent that to Spain for this Monet exhibit they're having. And she's like, oh my God, that's my favorite Monet painting in the whole world. And I thought it was gonna be here. And, you know, and she had come from Japan. She didn't come from Japan just to specifically see that painting, but she was in town and she was looking forward to seeing this painting um, because it's one of, there's like three really famous Monets at the National Guy Art, and this is one of them. And so when she found out it wasn't there, she was really, really upset. So um, you got to kind of um, make sure you find out if the paintings you want to see are actually there before you go check things out. So it's just kind of a, a sad story. But fortunately for her, the National Guy Art has a lot of other Monet. At that point in time, they had 19 Monet paintings on display. So there were 18 or there were 19 other ones that she could go check out. Okay, so these are kind of the areas around the garden. This is the path leading up to the garden. This is a really unusual painting because you don't see many later works of Monet where he does include the bridge, but this is one of them. So that's one, one thing that makes it unusual. Remember I said he usually doesn't include the bridge in later works. I didn't say always, but um, there are a few examples and this is what I mean. It's also unusual. It's kind of the, the coloring on it. It's like the fall colors of the yellows and the oranges and the reds. So that's very unusual that's at the Museum of Modern Art, leave it up to the MoMA uh, to have something kind of uh, off the beaten path, so to speak, stylistically from Monet. There's a close-up of that. These are some plants that Monet had installed near the pond. So the garden was really the inspiration for much of his later works. And it's one reason why he doesn't really leave home all that much because he sets up this spectacular garden. And it was kind of like uh, a Disney World like subject matter um, for him. He didn't really have to go anywhere. Like there's all these cool things that he can just kind of stay in his uh, state at Giverny and paint on. So he pretty much really, really the last many years of his life does not leave all that often. And again, he's also getting older in life. Um, you know, when he's in his 70s and stuff, he's not able to uh, travel as easily. And if you had to figure at that point in time, 80, if you live to 86 now, that's quite an accomplishment. But to live to be 86 in 1926, God, that would probably be like being 100 years old, maybe today, um, that would have been much more unusual. So later on in his life, he has, um, he's just not a you know young guy. Then also his vision, um, a few people asked about that or brought it up. So yeah, the last many years of his life, he does have a lot of vision problems which also would have contributed to him making the subject matter less detailed. Okay, we're getting close to the home stretch. These are our last two paintings. So um, these ones are very, very abstract. And these are two well-known works. So let's talk about these. This one is at the Museum of Modern Art called Water Lilies. This one, if you look down at the caption on the right, look at the date 1914 to 1926. What happened with Monet was he would frequently, sometimes when an artist makes a work, they'll just do it all in one sitting and knock it out. And sometimes they'll work on it um, over and over again and keep tweaking it and stuff. And Monet is kind of in that latter category. There were some paintings that he did on the spot, but he frequently tweaked and enhanced and modified his paintings. And so this particular one, he started working on it in 1914. And 12 years later, he still hadn't finished it. And then guess what happened? He died. Um, so I guess it was finished then, but that's why on this one, the date is 1914 to 1926, because it was one of the several that he was working on towards the end of his life. He couldn't quite get it the way he wanted it. There's a close-up view. And again, it's at the Museum of Modern Art. But I saved the best for last, probably the most impressive. If if you were to go to the museum, suppose you could get all 50 of these paintings in the same building and we could all go down there and check it out. Uh, those probably one, there, there'd probably one that you might like as your favorite one not, but the one that would be most impressive would probably be this one. And it's the very last one we're gonna talk about. It's another one of these paintings where he started work in 1914. And by the time he died, it was still somewhat of a work in progress. Now, if you look at it on the left, it's like, okay, that's, you know, that's cute. Um, but you might not realize is, 
the scale of it. So it's a really massive painting. And this is a picture of it at the Museum of Modern Art. And so again, the paintings uh, that we talked about, most of them are at the Met, but the BOMA has this one, which is really spectacular. And it's really large. It's three, actually three panels that are combined to be one painting. And they, over the decades, the museum has kind of set this up in different configurations. This was a prior setup they had. And this is the most recent one that I've seen. I haven't been to the Museum of Modern Art since before COVID. So I don't know if they've changed it since then. In fact, maybe I don't know if any of you um, would know if it's been rearranged, but this was pre-COVID. This was how the painting was displayed. And I wanted to include the chairs or these little cushion chairs here. So you can get a kind of perspective of how large this thing is. I mean, it's really massive. Um, and it's one thing that makes it so impressive. It's just the scale of it. Um, and Monet spent a huge amount of time working on this. Again, the 12 years <laughs> that it took um, to do this. Now, he was obviously working on other paintings at the same time, but it's really an extraordinary work. And he did a whole um, several different versions of this same type of thing where he made this large scale um, painting. And so you might have seen um, similar things as this to other museums throughout the world. But this one is at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And again, as the 50 paintings that I showed you tonight, there's probably some that you like the best in terms of the subject matter or the style or the coloring, wherever where. But again, if I had to guess, and if we were at the museum um, and could see all 50 of these in person, this would probably be the one that would impress you the most just because of the size of it and just the amount of time it would have taken to put something like this together would have really just been extraordinary. Here's a close up of it. Actually, let me go back from the beginning. So again, Monet born in 1840, passes away in 1926. So when he starts this, look, he's 74 years old when he starts working on this painting. And that's 74 years old in 1914, which a uh, little bit different than 74 years old today. There's the full, this picture on the left, I chopped off, I had to chop off the left and the right side so it could kind of have any kind of detail. Um, so that's why this version is a little bit uh, not as wide as this one. This is the full view, but when you try and put the full view on a slide, it doesn't really come out all that well. And again, this was the earlier display at the Museum of Modern Art. They just to kind of mix things up, um, change the configuration of it from time to time. And this is the most recent version they know of. It could possibly have changed since um, the COVID, but I'm not sure. So FYI. And again, the seats give you the perspective. There's a close up. And again, it's the close up of the water lilies on the pond. And you can see the flowers, the lilies themselves, the water. He's trying to give you a sense of what the light would have looked like interacting with the water and the water lilies and the clouds and all the other atmospheric type things. Here's a close up. It would, there's no way of knowing this, but it would be fascinating to know how many hours it took him to paint this. He worked on it for years. But again, he was also working on other paintings at the same time. So again, a recap, we looked at 50 Claude Monet paintings in New York City, 40 of them were at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, five were at the Museum of Modern Art, three were at the Brooklyn Museum, or I should say are, uh, one from the Guggenheim and one from the Frick. And again, these are the 50 that I know of, but I don't live in New York City. I've just visited there many, many times. If you know of any others that are in the New York City, five borough um, geographic area uh, that I missed, please let me know because I'll do this presentation again at some point in time in the future and I'll be happy to uh, include anything that I may have overlooked, but 50 paintings of Claude Monet in New York. And there's nowhere outside of Europe where you can go see 50 Monet paintings um, in such a small geographic area, unless you maybe go to like a special exhibit that a museum has had. But in terms of the collection number of Monet paintings, um, this is gonna be up at the top of the heap as far as places outside of Europe. And Monet did live a long life, but eventually all things must come to an end. And he passed away on December 5th, 1926. He's actually buried in a family plot at a church that's about maybe like a 10 or 15 minute walk from his estate at Giverny. And I always like to close with this, my favorite Monet quote of all time. 
everyone discusses my art and pretends or tries to understand as if it were even necessary to understand when all that is really necessary is just to love. So remember, you don't have to understand, just love. And with that, Claude Monet's 180th birthday, 15 days ago, November 14th, 1840. So if you haven't done so already, do Claude a favor and have a piece of birthday cake. Okay, so that's the end of our program. So let me do this.